टॉपिक ऑफ आवर डिस्कशन इज इंडियन आर्ट एंड आर्किटेक्चर बिटवीन 650 एडी एंड 1200 एडी लेट अस बिगिन विद एन ऑब्वियस स्टेटमेंट लाइक ऑल टाइम टेबल लाइक ऑल टाइम फ्रेम्स द टाइम फ्रेम विथ व्हिच वी आर कंसर्न इज समहाउट टेंटेटिव व्हेन यू थिंक ऑफ 650 एडी we really associate this year with the disintegration of gupta empire and when we talk about 1200 we loosely associate the period with the advent of islam in certain parts of the indian subcontinent these two dates have been used by historians for the sake of convenience we do not really know how the people of the past how the people in 650 ad or how the people in 1200 ad really looked at this period did they look at their own surrounding in terms of a decline a disintegration or was it for them a kind of uh, continuity the kings came and kings went away kingdom rose and kingdom fell but did they, did it really affect their lives similarly when we think of 1200 ad when we think of the advent of a new world view a new ideology on the uh, on indian soil did it mean an abrupt break from the past did the people of india unduly alarmed at was what was happening it is as a matter of convenience that we have to look at this time frame historians have debated on how to look at this period for example nihar ranjan rai argued and argued with sufficient uh, justification that here in this period we are really confronted with a new kind of situation which he called medievalism which was a break or which was a change from what had happened in the earlier periods of history in recent times professor b d chattopadhyay has contributed to this debate and between roy and chattopadhyay we now have a kind of coherent uh, picture of or coherent idea of how to look at this period the most important feature of this period is growth of regionalism if indian art and architecture of this period can be characterized by the most important element it is regionalism gupta art had created an all pervasive aesthetics this all pervasive notion of ideal form will be transformed will be redefined will be reused and reinvented by the artists by the craftsmen by the canon makers the makeup people who made the shilpa texts and by the patrons and devotees in the years between 7th and the 12th century ad how did it happen before the 7th century ad u indian history had witnessed an empire a big empire between the 4th and the let us say end of the 6th century ad under the guptas from 7th century onward new polities new political centers would emerge over the length and breadth of the subcontinent it is not just the growth of regional polities that make this period so important both in the domain of script and language forms of writing and language there will be an increasing tendency at regionalization similarly literature will again assume a distinct regional character other important and i would say defining feature would be a new kind of ideology 
dominantly feudal ideology. By this period, the money economy of the earlier period had completely collapsed. Agriculture became the mainstay of economy and the agricultural surplus generated on a grand, grand scale would give rise to a leisurely community who would emerge as patron of art and culture. And it is this community which will promote the idea of bhakti. This ideology will reinforce the new feudal social order where the tie of loyalty between the local potentates, the subject people and the intermediaries will be very, very important. And the concept of bhakti will reinforce not only the feudal society, it will reinforce much of the art and art architecture that would emerge during this period. It is in this period that both Brahminical Hinduism and Mahajana Buddhism will evolve a more complex character from the placid world of iconography of the Gupta period will now enter into a phase where the world is, the, the, the iconographic world will be dominated by multiple forms, multiple forms of Shiva, multiple forms of Vishnu, multiform, multiple forms of Devi. Similarly, in Mahajana Buddhism, the idea of Buddha and Bodhisattvas will now develop into large number of tantric deities, Tara and our followers. Similarly, in Jainism, large number of Shasana Devi and attendant Jokha of the Jaina Tirthankaras will be created. In other words, the religious scenario will become very complex. And this complexity, this elaboration from an, of an earlier, more simple, uh, structure will be a defining feature of the culture and more particularly of art and architecture of the period between 650 and 1200. It is in 7th century AD, a very significant development took place in Mahabalipuram in the state of Tamil Nadu. Sir, why is Mahabalipuram so important? Mahabalipuram is very important because it is here at Mahabalipuram that the artists and the patrons could come out of century old prejudice of using stone as a material for carving religious images. It is in the 7th century AD, largely because of the grand vision of an individual, Mahendra Barban, the great Pallava king, that a new experiment began on the natural outcrops facing the sea, Bay of Bengal at Mahabalipuram. The Mahabalipuram experiment was soon replicated on the Sajjadri mountains at Elora, close to Aurangabad, and at Aurangabad itself, or at Elephanta, close to Mumbai. Cave temples dedicated to the Brahminical cults, dedicated to Buddhism, dedicated to Jainism were fabricated. And the entire wall surface were richly carved with narratives as well as religious images. Here the artist not only experimented with new kind of challenges, they explored the possibility of using diagonals to its fullest possible extreme. The balanced, poised world of the Gupta art had been changed and a world of art was created which was full of activity which was full of dynamism and this really marks the earlier phase 
of the period with which you are concerned. Please tell us, sir, what are the major temple forms in India? The tradition of temple architecture in India goes back to the Gupta period. But between the 7th and the 12th century AD, the temple forms of India became far more complex and reached a level of maturity unprecedented in the history of temple architecture. The three basic temple forms, Nagara, Dravida, and Beshara, are clearly geographical in character. Nagara form prevails in greater part of northern India, whereas the Dravida tradition is concentrated primarily in southern India. And Beshara, which is also known as Bhumija or Chalukya, has its area of concentration in Karnataka and Maharashtra region. Basically, forms are very simple. For example, in the Nagara form, the essential elements are a cruciform ground plan and a carvilinear shikhara. In case of Dravida, the tower is arranged in gradually receding stories with a domical crowning element. Beshara tradition draws upon both the northern and the southern elements or the Nagara and the Dravida elements. Besides, it is during this period that the cave temple tradition became very important, whereas I have just explained to you that natural rocks were scooped and uh, temples hewn out of the rock. In the domain of Buddhist architecture, the simple stupa of the earlier period will now give way to the growth of increasingly complex stupa form with very elaborate chhatra, with very elaborate superstructure. And this tradition will be further uh, carried forward and made much more complex in the Himalayan uh, territories of Nepal and uh, let us say Tibet. So, the main course of development of Indian architecture, temple architecture to be precise, is from a simple form to an increasingly complex form. In a city like Madurai, for example, the entire city or the substantial part of the city is enclosed within these gopurams or temple gateways. So the journey is from a simple form to an increasingly complex form wherein at one point of time the substantial portion of the landscape is enclosed within the temple complex. There are also several sub-regional varieties. The temples in Odisha, for example, the very significant group of temples in Bhuvaneshwar, is, is in Nagara style, as are the temples of Khajuraho in Madhya Pradesh. But there are very important differences between the Nagara style of architecture in Odisha and Nagara style of architecture in Khajuraho. Regionalism becomes the hallmark of art and architecture. Nagara is a, is a regional tradition, Dravida is a regional tradition, but going beyond the Nagara and Dravida categories, there are also further regional uh, traditions like the Odishan tradition, like the Madhya Pradesh tradition, like the tradition of Rajasthan and Gujarat. Similarly, in South India, the tradition reflected in the Chola period temples at Tanjur, for example, the great temple of Priyadishwara at Tanjur, or somewhat later temples in Kerala, they are different, implying that the artists and their patron kept on exploring new areas within 
a pro within certain broad stylistic and iconographic parameters. When we talk about architecture, we have also to remember that the most important and certainly the most productive phase, the most productive dimension of the art activity during this period are the sculptures. And when we talk about the sculptures, it is basically sculptures related to the temple. So we are talking primarily of temple sculptures. As we all know, Gupta sculpture defined certain norms and in the post-Gupta period from 7th century AD, the artists experimented with these norms but artists also tried to find out his own course of creativity. This is how the great tradition of sculptures centering around the temples in Odisha came into being. Everywhere the artist experimented with the form. The artist moved on to a different world. His world is dominated by scenes depicting prince and princess, scenes depicting the religious personalities, the monks and the sadhus. He had now very large space to be filled in by sculptures. The artist was not walking alone. In a temple complex, he was walking with other craftsmen. The wood carver, the goldsmith, the metal workers, lapidary workers, so all kind of people he was working with. And their experiences, their perception of form, their technique, their method of overcoming challenges posed by the material, all these must have influenced him substantially. We not only think of this period in terms of profusion of sculpture, we also think of this period in terms of artist ability to experiment with monumental forms and with very minute ornamental uh, decoration. So, what is common between the regional traditions? Well, the most important aspect of commonality is the celebration of life. At Konarak, from the base onward, you have rows of figures indulging in all kind of human activity. You have rows of procession, you have rows of animals, you have long queue of royal personalities. You have human forms in possible and impossible gestures. Everywhere the artists were exploring, celebrating human life in all its ramification. And I think that is one very important uh, element that unites different traditions. We should also seriously ponder the erotic contents on the temple walls. There have been debates how to explain the erotic element. But let us accept that they are a part of ever enlarging human experience. And this is how they are located on the temple. This sense of accommodation of every possible element within his creative scheme make the tradition so very important and I think that is the real commonality between the traditions. Another important aspect of art during this period is painting. And when we talk about painting, it is both mural, wall painting and 
manuscript painting. The tradition of mural painting is rooted to the great tradition of Ajanta murals. They are very repetitive and formulaic in nature. But from 8th century onward, at the cave temple of Elora, the artist experimented with the modeling quality of Ajanta and also the possibility of stretching the linear forms. And this experiment continued at Badami, at Sitt and Vasal, the mural tradition which really began at Ajanta continued unabated. But what really emerged as unique to this period is the tradition of manuscript paintings. And here we have two major areas of importance. One is Eastern India, another is Western India. In Eastern India, we have the Buddhist manuscript paintings from around 10th, 11th century AD. And in Western India, we have Jain manuscript paintings from around the 10th century AD. But unlike Eastern India, in Western India, we have not only the manuscript paintings of Jain themes, we also have some non-religious themes, for example, the story of Kalaka. Although the king Kalaka turned to Jainism ultimately, but part of the story is strictly not religious. So, in the period with which we are concerned, mural tradition continued, as I said, in Elora, in Badami, in Sitanavasal, in Kanchipuram, uh, even in Nalanda in 9th, 10th century AD. But the dominant tradition was the manuscript tradition. In Eastern India, it was predominantly Buddhist, and in Western India, it was predominantly J Jain. In Western India, the artist could experiment with the linear possibility of line. Whereas in Eastern India, artists were somewhat bound by the earlier tradition. Between these two geographical regions, the, uh, the early medieval period produced a great tradition of manuscript painting which remains unsurpassed even in the subsequent period. The creativity of the period did not come to an end with architecture, sculpture, and painting. Artists' creativity touched every sphere of life, whether it is art of clay, the terracotta figurines. We have some of the best examples in Eastern India, in a site like Jagjivanpur, from Bangladesh in sites like Paharpur, Mainamati. We have very fine examples of ivory working, especially from Kashmir. We have few very good examples from other parts of the subcontinent. The artists must have worked in metal. We have very large number of bronze images from different parts of the country and more particularly from, from Eastern India. The artist worked in wood. We have few examples surviving from Bengal and artists must have worked with all available medium, some of which are essentially ephemeral in nature. He must have worked on textile. We do not have the examples. They, are, they have not survived the ravages of time. He must have worked on two-dimensional material, painting. Apart from the uh, manuscript painting, there, there must have been a very rich tradition of popular painting, which has not survived. But the point that I am trying to make is the artist's creativity pervaded our entire existence. There was not one single aspect of human existence which remained untouched by the artist's creativity. In the process, a great but diverse tradition of art and architecture came up, grew up in the period between 650 and 1200.